Well, hey everybody, my name's Aaron and it's time for another edition of E-Waste Wednesday. And do I have a treat for today's episode. It's a Macintosh SE and boy, is this thing dirty. Can I get it to work? And how much did this thing cost? We'll find out the answers right now on the Retro Hack Shack. Well, hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. My regular viewers will know that I like to do occasionally something called E-Waste Wednesday, and that's what we're doing today. If you take the first letters of E-Waste Wednesday, that spells out EW. Hi everyone, welcome to L. <laughs> and today is certainly no exception to that because uh, I've got this Macintosh SE30 and boy, is it dirty. I'll show you some close-ups in just a minute of how dirty this thing really is. So uh, I've got my fingers crossed that this we can get this thing to work, but we'll just have to see. I've actually been looking for a Macintosh SE for a while and this thing is heavy. It is oh so heavy. Um, so it's definitely got some, uh, probably some additions inside or something going on because it's way heavier than a plus. It, probably has a hard drive in here and maybe some other goodies on the inside as well. But first, just look at how dirty this thing actually is. So as I pan up here, you will see, ooh, the grime. <laughs> I mean, it is just tremendously dirty. I don't know how else to look at, just look at that. I mean, I don't know where this was stored, maybe on a rack somewhere in a shop or something but it is super, super dirty and uh, will definitely require a cleaning montage or at least a uh, some kind of a, a cleaning uh, part to this episode because it's just super, super dirty. Um, but the good news is I was really interested in this when I saw it because it appears to be in good shape. I mean, there's no uh, cracks or anything else that I can see on the case. It just happens to be dirty and probably, you know, a lot of times people will see something dirty like this and think, ah, I'm not, I'm not interested in that. Look how dirty it is. It's probably full of germs and whatnot. But I tell you, you spend a few minutes cleaning these things up and they will look like a million bucks. There's some interesting things I noticed right away before I crack this thing open. Number one is there's a sticker on the top and it says tested. Okay. Let's see if I can just clean that up. I'll probably wipe the ink off whenever it was tested. Oh, there we can see. I mean, to me, that looks like it says maybe. February 94, this thing was tested by somebody. Um, RO is the initials on this, I think. Yeah, RO. So in February of 94, at least, this thing was still working. We'll see if it still is in 2023, which is when I'm testing this. Um, also on the side here, which is a little bit cleaner, I can see there's a moving sticker, NorCal Movers number 16. So maybe this was in somebody's office or something at some point, but definitely got moved along the way. Now the Macintosh SE came in several flavors. Um, this one is the one megabyte version, as you can see right here on the label, uh, one megabyte of RAM and two floppy drives. What? Two 800K floppy drives? That's not what I saw in the front. Now, I realized after I shot this little segment here that this was actually a Macintosh SE back on a Macintosh SE 30 front. So I figured this out shortly after I edited this little part here. And there's further evidence on the side of the case. As you can see that the back case, the color of the back case does not match the color of the front case. So um, it looks like they definitely came from different machines just by looking at the side of the case here. These screws, there should be one there and one over there, and those screws are missing. So, hmm, let's see what we can find. I'm going to go ahead and open this up. We'll see if there, uh, what evidence there is in here. Uh, maybe someone did like an Uber upgrade or something like that. Or maybe they tried to get it to work and mess things up and we're going to have a bad day, but we'll see. Let's open it up and take a look. And even though there was two missing screws down here at the bottom, there were the two screws up here uh, in the top of the case as they usually are behind the handle here. And it looks like someone may have tried to pry this open at some time uh, because this corner is bulging here. So maybe someone tried to, didn't know about those screws and were trying to pry this open over here in this corner. But we should be able to lay this thing down now, very careful, and this should come off. There we go. All right, and we're in like Flynn. Uh-oh. And I see a note, someone has indeed been in here. 
It looks like this is somebody's spares unit, because even though it's heavy, there is no hard drive or floppy drive inside, and it just says on the back here, bad ADB filter. So at first glance, I don't see anything glaringly wrong with the, uh, the motherboard or anything. So aside not having a floppy drive or hard drive, this Frankenstein of a case might still work. Let's go ahead and uh, pull out the motherboard. We can see how much RAM is still there, if any. And these boards have the chassis comes over and folds over the motherboard like this. But there are spacings here that line up with those folds. So if you can pull the motherboard back, so that it lines up with those holes, you should be able to take it out much more easily. And here's a look at the main board. It looks like we have definitely some memory in here. Some, uh, I don't know if that was the original memory, but there's definitely four memory SIMs here and nothing really else on the board. No extra cards or anything. Although there is the battery uh, over there, which I will uh, take out now and that should be either replaced or left out at this point. Still looks like an old battery to me, not one that someone has replaced. So yeah, we better get that out of there. And we can also see the Macintosh ROM SIM, uh, which I at first thought was memory. Uh, but right up there at the top is the, uh, the ROM for the unit, unlike what you would expect to see, or at least I would expect to see out of a computer of this era. You know, down here we have the video ROM and it says Apple 1988. So that tells you how old this particular SE is. Uh, but I'm used to seeing ROMs, for example, in the IBM, early IBM units, which had uh, 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 ROM chips like these, programmable ROM chips. Uh, but on the Macintosh SE, you get this memory looking ROM SIM. So there should be some tabs on this cover for the battery. It's pretty loosely held on. Uh, but there should be a tab here, which lets us, yep, take this off. And there should be one on the other side. I don't want to break it necessarily. I'd like to keep it intact, but it's just going to come off, I think. There it goes. There we go. Glad that didn't break. Sometimes those plastics can be brittle. Let's go ahead and take that out of there. And uh, yeah, we wouldn't want to have this explode in the case. Well, I was just going to put this back in and uh, turn it on and see if it worked. And I probably will do that in a minute, but... I don't know if you can see what I'm seeing. Uh, definitely some green corrosion down there on those pins. So it looks like the, the caps in this area have probably leaked. And it doesn't look horrible, but it looks bad enough to have me concerned. But yeah, lots of green stuff. Even down on those yellow uh, chips down there, I'm seeing a lot of green stuff on the pin. So. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and throw some uh, some vinegar on there and let it do its thing. And then we'll uh, wash that off. And then maybe it'll work at that point. Maybe not. But I definitely want to neutralize that corrosion right away to keep it from spreading anymore. So off to the smelly vinegar we go. And while that motherboard is soaking in some vinegar, I want to thank today's sponsor, PCB Way. PCB Way not only offers low-cost PCB manufacturing, CNC milling, and more, but they also have a great project page. And just look what I found on the project page. It's a replica of the SE motherboard that you can purchase and have manufactured by PCB Way, or even have it fully assembled. So if you wanted a replica SE30 motherboard to replace the one that may be damaged beyond repair, by a capacitor explosion like what happened in my SE30, you can go to PCB Way and check it out. And I thank them for their support of the Retro Hack Shack. Okay, it's the next day now and the board seems to be dry. I let some vinegar kind of soak in on top of the board. I poured a bunch of vinegar over here. Anywhere where these caps were in a general vicinity, I made sure was, was covered in vinegar for a while, two hours actually. And then I went back with a toothbrush and brushed off all those contacts to make sure they were nice and clean and there was no more corrosion left, at least visibly. So that should neutralize any of the corrosion. And then I rinsed this board with distilled water. Now you could also use deionized water. It's a bit more expensive and harder to find. Uh, but tap water um, is going to leave minerals and salts and things on the board uh, that will leave your board looking pretty dingy and uh, 
uh, will certainly will, will be noticeable over time uh, and could cause, I guess, some, some problems on the board. Although, really, I think it comes down to a matter of looks for most people. So, um, yeah, I recommend distilled water at least or deionized water, which is even one step further to get the, the purest water possible. You rinse your board in that and then your boards will come out looking really nice. Now, the next thing I want to do is this has been sitting overnight, but I do want to just spray some compressed air on some of these sockets just to make sure that no water is left underneath them because the water can hide, especially underneath like the memory sockets because they're rather large or this socket over here, even the ICs over here and the CPU and things like that. Water will, will trap under there and could hide. So if water's anywhere on this board, it'll be underneath some of these sockets. So I'm just gonna use some compressed air here and just uh, give a little uh, spray of air underneath the sockets and see if any water comes spraying out the other side. Okay, so it doesn't seem to be any water droplets at all coming out. It'd be pretty evident if it was. It might be hard to see on camera, uh, but I can see no uh, uh, water droplets at all coming out from any of the sockets or any of the memory. So this board is good to move to the next step. Okay, I do want to take a look at some of those uh, joints and legs and things where all that corrosion was. And a real quick and easy way to do that is with one of these microscopes here. These, uh, I don't know how much they are. They're pretty cheap on, on Amazon. That's a USB microscope. It comes with a, a focusing lens here by turning this. And you can get in pretty close to things and see what I mean. I'll be capturing this over here on the laptop, but let me just show you how close you can get. Ultra close-up time so we can take a look at where that corrosion was and make sure that there's no uh, damage that needs to be repaired. All right, so just to show you how close we can get, I mean, this is a uh, really close image here. And I'm just holding this over the areas. That's why it's uh, so shaky if you can see the image on the screen. So I apologize for that. Uh, but you can get in really close to the areas that you need to look at. And what I'm looking for is these traces here and especially where they connect to the, uh, the pins on these chips. This is that resistor pack, um, the yellow chip that I showed before. Yeah, I'm just looking for any, any permanent damage. Here's another chip over here. See if I can get that into focus, there we go. Get really close with this little thing. And I either use my camera, sometimes I'll use my, the camera on my phone to look at these legs and uh, traces and things like that. But in this case, I'm just using this little USB microscope. And for the money, it's really worth it if you're doing work close-up work like this on boards and things like this, because it really can give you a good bird's eye view, really close up of what's going on. What I'd be looking for here is like these two traces right here that are coming off this chip. I would be looking at where they connect to the uh, uh, the pins there, where they connect to the pads rather, because that's where the corrosion likes to eat those away. So if there's gonna be a break in somewhere along here, it's one of the areas it's gonna be is right here where these traces connect to the pads. But these all look fine. Let's just take a look at some of these other sockets and things just to make sure everything's looking okay. Yeah, so look at that, uh, the, these vias here are all kind of eaten away. So you can see the exposed copper underneath on those vias. They look redder than, than the other ones. That's where that corrosion was. But those look okay. It looks like those are gonna be fine. Yeah, this all looks, this all looks just fine. So hopefully that corrosion was just uh, in the early stages of, of happening. I'm going to go ahead and remove those caps though because they will continue to leak and I'll replace those with some new ones. Okay, there aren't too many caps that need to be replaced on this board, but the ones that go bad, of course, are these electrolytic caps, kind of famously uh, bad during this time period. So I'm gonna be replacing all of those since I have the board out, why not? Why not make this video a little bit longer? <laughs> this whole series was supposed to be, this Wednesday e-waste thing was supposed to be a quick uh, video that I could do and share something with you guys. And, uh, yeah, it turned out that I can't resist. Like when I hit a problem like this in a Wednesday, uh, e-waste Wednesday video, I just, I'm compelled to just go ahead, go all out. So, uh, anyway, hope you like the content. So if you do give it a thumbs up, why not? So, uh, I'm going to be taking these, um, these caps out here and replacing them. You could replace them with tantalums. I just happen to have electrolytics on hand, which should last another 30 or 40 years or so. Um, they shouldn't be as bad as these and it'll be a more exact replacement, but tantalums certainly are, are not going to leak. Um, you just have to be careful of which tantalums you use. Uh, so to get these off, I'm gonna be using the twist method. I was super skeptical of this when I first saw it on a couple of other channels, but then I tried it and it really does work well. I did a bunch of caps on a board and didn't rip a single pad off. 
You do have to be careful though, if the pads are already weak, um, you know, you, you may end up pulling a pad off if the corrosion has already gotten in there. So if that's important to you, you might want to use hot air or something else to get these off. Um, but I think all these connections are good. So I'm just going to go ahead and use the twist method. And to do this, you grab the electrolytic capacitor with some pliers and you twist. You don't want to pry to one side or the other. You want to use a twisting mo motion that is perpendicular with the, the cap itself. And it, it should break the internal leads. Um, so let's just try this with this one and see what happens. There we go. Came right off. And in fact, the <laughs> maybe these pads are worse than I thought because this one just popped off the pads. Um, so I don't have to desolder the bottom of it. Usually what would happen is uh, this bottom plastic part and these two legs here, these two pins on the capacitor would stay in place. But in this case, it came right off and the pads are still there. So if this board was having issues, it could have been because the corrosion had caused a disconnection in these caps. Okay, here's one that came off as expected. Usually what'll happen is it'll leave the uh, leave this little plastic thing behind and then you can take that little plastic part off and uh, maybe, let's see if I can get under there. There we go. You take that little plastic bit out of there and usually that will leave the legs. The legs of the uh, capacitor will usually stay on the pads like that and they'll just break off internally. So that's what normally happens. Okay, so to clean these pads up, I'm just gonna be using a bit of fresh solder here. There we go. That should soften things up considerably and you should be able to get out any last remaining um, legs that are still attached to these pads here from the, uh, the capacitors. There we go. And I can definitely smell the electrolytics that were coming out of those caps. So um, yeah, that's not, not good at all. Um, but once you've gotten the, uh, got some extra solder on there and you've taken care of the, uh, um, getting the, the pads off the, or the pins off the pads, I should say, then you can come back with some um, solder wick or solder braid like this. What you don't want to do is you don't want to move this around on the board because it's abrasive and could cause more damage on the board, like cutting through traces and things like that. So you don't want to press down on this with your soldering iron and then drag it all around the board like that because it'll cause problems. So you just want to just want to suck that solder off that's on there. You can move it a little bit, but don't move it too much. And then that should leave us with a pretty clean pad that we can clean up with some IPA. So now these pads here are actually uh, pretty clean. They'll clean up really nicely with some isopropyl alcohol and they'll be ready to re-solder, paying attention to the marks for the positive side here, in this case of the capacitor, because that will need to be put in with the correct uh, uh, orientation for the uh, polarized nature of those capacitors. Okay, let's bring the microscope out again and we can take a closer look at my Probably awful job when you look close up. Ooh, yeah, see, it's a good thing we looked at this. I don't think these traces are damaged too much, but you can see where the corrosion might have damaged them, and you wouldn't be able to see that um, without taking the caps off first. But see where that all that corrosion is? I've already hit this with some uh, IPA, and it's been sitting in vinegar. So I think all of that is neutralized, but you know, if you had a question, um, it might be good to go ahead and test these traces with your multimeter to make sure they had continuity. So I might do that while I have these off and I can see them okay. Because that is a problem. Apple in their infinite wisdom, they probably never thought these caps would go bad or anybody would be using these computers or wanting to use these computers so late in the game here. Yep, I'm just gonna clean these off a bit more and then test those traces, but they look, at least at first glance, they look okay. And these are the worst ones. The other ones are all much clearer, but I'll take a look at those uh, using this scope as well. Okay, so the recap is done. And uh, I kind of actually like the look of these red colored caps on this board. It kind of makes it look like it's been uh, pimped out a bit here, even though it's just replacement caps. And I didn't have this cap right here. So the smallest one is the only one that's this size on an SE30, which is this one microfarad cap. These are 47s and I did have enough of those, but I didn't have any uh, one microfarads in a surface mount um, 
uh, package. So I had to go ahead and use this one microfarad 50 volt one that I had, which is just a regular electrolytic, and I just soldered it to the pads, and it should be fine. It shouldn't be too high so that this can still slide in. But with that, I think we're ready to finally test this out. I can't believe I haven't tested this yet. Um, so I hope it works. Who knows? Maybe the whole thing was just a big waste of time. I hope not. Let's go ahead and reinstall it and power it on and see what happens. Okay, power is plugged in. I'm going to be careful not to put my hands or anything around the back of this area. Very dangerous to work on CRTs if you don't know what you're doing. Fair warning. Um, and I don't know if the Mac will boot. I don't know if the SE30 will actually boot without seeing a floppy drive connected, but we can try it. So here we go. Here's nothing. Let's see what happens. Oh, got a bong. And got a screen. So it shouldn't, obviously it's not going to give us a, uh, it's not going to boot anything because nothing's connected, but it is powering up and booting. Heard the speaker, so that's good. But at least we've got a screen. I can see a cursor, so that is a good sign. There we go. Question mark. Can't find a boot disk. So yeah, this is actually a success. This is awesome. I wasn't sure if I should have done all that work before I at least tested it, but I could tell by the corrosion that it needed to be worked on. So might as well get all that out of the way, spend the time to do it right, and uh, we're rewarded with a working Mac. Let's go ahead and see if we can get a floppy drive and maybe even a hard drive connected and uh, see if we can get something booted up on this thing. All right, well, I rooted around in my stash of stuff and I remembered that I had pulled out, I got a non-working, didn't feature it on eWaste Wednesday, but a non-working SE, I think it was, Macintosh SE that the tube was broken on, but I bought it for parts anyway and I was able to get the floppy drive and hard drive out of it and I knew that, you know, maybe someday I would need those. And so I set those aside and didn't know it would be so soon because that was only a few months ago. But these should work on here. This is this hard drive. Now, who knows if the hard drive is working? That's going to be interesting to see. But this is uh, it's upside down there, but it says hard disk uh, 40SC. So we'll see if we can get this hard drive working. And then for some reason on the floppy drive, number one, it's super dirty on the inside there. But number two, uh, for some reason, there's a sticker on it that I wrote. That's my handwriting that says no power. But that I don't think that applies to this drive. I think that because I wouldn't have written no power, I don't think, on a floppy drive. And the unit wouldn't work anyway. So there's no way I could determine that no power. Usually I would write not spinning up or something like that on a floppy drive. So I'm hoping that this was the note that I had put on the SE as I was uh, testing it out to see if the tube was, and then I, later I found out the tube was, was broken. So I'm hoping that this was the note that I had on the SE, and then I just put it on here and then forgot to take it off and put this away because it doesn't make any sense. This is not a typical note that I would write. So, but this is very dirty. So I'm gonna take this apart and lube it up a little bit, make sure uh, things are at least looking good on the inside and then we'll install it in the Mac SE30 and see if we can get it to boot. Okay, well, I opened up that floppy drive and yeah, this grease is all dried up. It's, it's sticky, it's not greasy anymore, it's just sticky. So this mechanism, let's see if I can get it to go in. So if I put a disc in here, look at that, it doesn't even go, doesn't even go in very well. It's, oh, so sticky. Yeah, the whole thing is just really, it's like going so slow. It should go all the way really easily, and uh, it's not. So, yeah, this has to, uh, there we go. This definitely needs to be cleaned and lubricated. So in order to do that, I'm just going to use some IPA and clean off as much of this gunk as I can, and then I'll use some uh, white lithium grease to uh, lubricate anywhere where there was lubrication before. There's several spots on here that probably need lubrication. And while I'm in here, uh, I might as well go ahead and put some on the rails and on the drive screw here attached to the stepper motor. Um, but I'll clean those off first and attach and then put a little bit of uh, the lithium grease. A little goes a long way. You don't need too much. You can see how much was on here originally, you know, almost almost nothing. So you don't want to overdo it. Just put a tiny little bit and work the thing, work things back and forth after you get them clean. And uh, and that should take care of it as long as the stepper motors work or the uh, eject mechanism is working. Hopefully it is, then everything else should be fine. 
Okay, well, I'm deep in the bowels of the uh, floppy drive here, trying to figure out exactly what's causing the, the issue. So these definitely need to be um, uh, lubed. I cleaned these up a little bit. I'll still work on them. But this is what you had seen originally. This was sitting here like this. Yeah, this, this is moving, actually. This is feeling good. The springs are nice and tight. So um, I will lube that, but that's not the issue with getting the, the discs in and out. The issue is with this bottom sled right here. And as, as I slide this along, I can feel it's just dragging um, like crazy. And these, these black washers are, are on here like this. And I thought that the problem was there with the black washers, uh, you know, in this, this really dry, gritty uh, or sticky grease that had dried up. But then when I took those off, it was still sticking. And so what the problem really is, and unfortunately, you have to take the, dr the drive all apart, unclip the motor, unscrew the motor so you can get this sled out. The problem really is between this plate on the bottom and the bottom surface of the drive. So this is where the drive runs along um, right here. And this grease has just dried out to the point where it's just really causing a lot of extra friction. So if you have this problem, uh, maybe this will help you, but you do have to take everything apart, get all the way down to here. The good news about taking it all apart, though, is now I can get easier access to the the screw, the drive screw there and the rails to put a little lube on there while I'm in here. So a little bit of a pain to take this all apart, but it's not that as intimidating as it looks. Uh, it actually comes apart quite easy. And uh, once I get this clean, it'll be easy enough to put some new grease on here and it should work like a champ. Something else I just noticed about this drive is it is an MFD 75W01G or down here on the uh, Sony label, an MP. 75W01G. That means this is a super drive, so-called super, because um, before the SE and the Macintosh 2, you probably had an 800K drive, or if you had an earlier Mac, you might have had a 400K drive. This is a 1.44 meg drive, but it was also backwards compatible to 800 and 600. So for retro enthusiasts, this drive is actually really nice to have because if you need to make, for some reason, some 800K discs for a friend or 400K discs or something, you can use this drive and it'll read all three different formats for Mac. So I assume that that'll work on the SE 30 because the SE 30 was basically uh, a Mac 2 in a different form factor on the inside. If you look at what's available on the motherboard, very similar to the, the Mac 2, just in the, the Macintosh classic uh, uh, form factor here. However, I didn't have a cable for either the floppy drive or the uh, uh, hard drive. I didn't have any extras. So I pulled out these cables from a Mac SE that had an 800K drive in it. And that's important because this has the red stripe. So if you go back in time to the 400K drives and the 800K drives, they had a cable like this, which had the red stripe on one side. There was also a version of this cable with a yellow stripe that I believe only worked with the 800K drives. You can correct me in the comments below, but there was something special about that yellow stripe cable. I think it had two pins disconnected. And so I'm assuming that the yellow striped cable would not work with this super drive, but uh, I'm not exactly sure. And I'm hoping that this red striped cable has all the pins connected and uh, it will work with this drive. All right, here is a Macintosh uh, System Tools disk, 6.0.8. So I'm gonna go ahead and pop that in there and we'll start this up. That went in very nicely, by the way. Let's see if it works. Drum roll, please. Ooh. Ooh, it did not like that. Yeah, that did not sound good at all when it was trying to actually read the disc. It, it did start to spin. I don't know if you could hear that noise, but it was a bad, bad noise. Okay, well, the good news is it does come up to a, uh, a prompt here. Let's just go ahead and insert this disc and try again. Ooh. Oh, yeah, it, it tries to read the disc, but the motor has an awful, awful sound. Um, this may be a 
non-working drive after all that effort or I may need to uh, may need to replace that motor somehow. Let me hook up the hard drive and see what's on there, see if that'll boot it. I don't know what version or I don't know if there's any information on that hard drive. But let's go ahead and hook it up and uh, hopefully we can read some information off that. Okay, keep your fingers crossed. Let's see if this hard drive will boot up. I can hear the hard drive spinning. Oh, it's booting up in French or something. Oh, interesting. What is going on here? Okay, well, I took a look at that screen and I went and got a keyboard and mouse and hooked those up. I also went and grabbed a cleaning disc um, and put that through uh, a few times to clean off those heads and the motor also stopped making that noise after a little bit. So I think the motor also had just a little bit of gumming on it and just exercising a little bit was helping it out. And then I went ahead and cleaned the disc. However, there's another problem now. Now when I turn this on, uh, I get to the welcome screen. Okay, here we go. It's actually booting from the floppy now, so that's good. Is it going to boot into anything? No, it gets to this point in the boot screen, and it just stops. It just stops at the welcome screen, and it does this on the hard drive when I try to boot from the hard drive as well. Now, of course, I can't get the disk out because it won't get past this point. So I think there's something else going on here. The only thing I changed really was I plugged in the... Uh, the keyboard and mouse. So maybe, maybe there's something wrong with the keyboard and mouse. Let me try that and see what happens. I'll unplug those. Oh, yeah. As soon as I unplugged the mouse and the keyboard, it started booting the rest of the way. Now, of course, I can't, I can't do anything because the keyboard and mouse aren't plugged in. <sighs> so I think that note about the bad ADB buffer is correct, probably uh, potentially anyway, that the there's something wrong with the ADB chip in here or some of the circuitry that goes for the ADB and it just won't boot and won't operate. Even if I hook this up after the fact, uh, after it's booted up, I still can't get anything to work. Yeah, nothing, nothing's working through the through the keyboard at all. Yeah, unfortunately. Until I can get some replacement parts, I think that's as far as I can go with this project. Yeah, and there we go. Boots right up with nothing plugged into the ADB ports. Here we go. I, I can't speak French and I don't know what else is on here or what version this is or anything like that about what's on the hard drive because I can't control anything because the mouse and the keyboard don't work. All right, folks, I was just about to give up on this board. In fact, I had turned the camera off and had gone inside kind of called it a day, but I did some research. It turns out there is a fuse on this family of boards. I think it's on some of the Mac 2s as well. Here's the ADB ports in the back here, and there's a fuse just behind those ADB ports. And so I thought, well, that's easy to test. I might as well grab the board out and test it. And sure enough, there is no connection. You can see my monitor there should be ringing out like crazy if this was a good fuse, but this thing is completely open. So this fuse has been blown and that's a great sign because I can actually go in and see if I can find a fuse even if it's even if it's a big one just to test I can get a fuse stick it in there and see if this will work okay I've got a keyboard and mouse hooked back up fingers crossed that this works and I'll know because it was hanging up on the welcome prompt so if I get past the welcome prompt that's a good sign should I even bother moving them oh, the mouse is moving the mouse is moving. It was that fuse. Okay, it didn't hang up. We're at the desktop. Awesome. Look at that. Let's see if it's, yes, and it's moving. The mouse is moving. I've never been so excited to see a mouse move. Um, okay, so now we can look at the, uh, well, it's all in French still, but this is uh, system 6.0.7 and uh, four meg of RAM. So that's awesome. Now I just need to figure out how to change this into English. We can take a look at the hard drive and just see if there's anything else on this thing worth looking at. But this looks like, except for cleaning, it is totally fixed now.
Yeah, so I haven't been able to switch this into English. It may have been a separate install, like a French install and an English install. You Mac heads will know probably off the top of your head. Uh, but I was able to find that this does have um, WordPerfect on it, at least. Uh, if we, and it's strangely located in preferences. And if I click this little sans titre here, it will load up WordPerfect. And we can test out the keyboard. So that all looks like it's working. Keyboard's working fine now with that fused fix. Apparently it is working. So now I'm gonna go ahead and put the case back on and get it cleaned up. Well, now that I know this thing is working, it's finally time to give it the cleanup it deserves. I started by taking it outside and using some compressed air to remove as much of the dirt and uh, particles from the inside of the case as I could. Sometimes when there's this much buildup, it really does make a difference to try to uh, get as much of this off as you can, because otherwise you're just gonna be moving it around with your rags and uh, cleanup materials. Next, I wanted to remove these stickers, and I got a little lucky here in that these are vinyl stickers instead of paper stickers. Paper stickers tend to separate and leave half the sticker on the material that you're removing it from, uh, but vinyl stickers luckily come off pretty nicely. They just leave a little sticky residue, but at least they come off fairly cleanly. Next, it was time for a bath in the kitchen sink for the back part of the case here. And you can see how easily this dirt actually comes off in water. So luckily it wasn't stuck on too hard. I was able to scrub the whole case with a scouring pad. And then I used a toothbrush to clean out all of these little vents and ridges until they were nice and clean. For the sticker residue, I used some of this uh, Ronsonol lighter fluid. It actually works great for this uh, old sticker. You can see how easily that just comes off. If you ever have any old sticker residue to remove, highly recommend this lighter fluid, ironically, to get this off. It works great, doesn't hurt the paint. And then for any last little marks, like those black scuff marks you often see, or in this case, some little drops of whiteout, or I don't know what this was, maybe a little bit of paint. I like to use some Magic Eraser, as it's commonly known in the supermarket, or it's also known as Melamine Sponge, I think. Uh, but this stuff works really well. Do keep in mind that this is a abrasive, like a really, really light sandpaper, and it'll probably decolor the uh, case, whether it's paint or plastic. It'll remove a small layer, just like retrobriting does. So I like to go around this again in kind of large circles uh, after I'm done with the little spots to kind of even out the color of the case or whatever I'm working on. I try to be pretty thorough, so even if the bottom of the case gets some love here, just trying to remove uh, the last few remaining bits of those little black scuff marks here. Maybe nobody would ever bother to see this, but I'll know it's there, and so it would bother me if I didn't at least give it a try to clean up some of this stuff at this point. Now I wanted to turn my attention to the front of the case, and I didn't really want to take this all apart, although you could, but it's a real pain in the butt to take out the CRT and everything. So I decided to try to use some paper towel here to keep as much of the cleaning liquid off uh, the, the monitor itself, because I didn't want it leaking down behind the bezel there. And that seemed to do the trick. I was able to get that front bezel nice and clean. Um, as we saw, it came off easily, just like with the back case and didn't have to get any leaking cleaning fluid down inside the computer. After that, it was just a matter of being careful to clean up the rest of the CRT and the surrounding bezel, and then work really hard actually to get all of the dirt and grime out of the grill area here, this plastic piece. But with some time and determination, I was able to get all of the grime off the front of the computer. Just like with the back of the case, the front of the case got a little bit of spot treatment with the melamine sponge just to remove those last few ink marks and black scuffs. While I was cleaning, I noticed a few of the screws that were holding the CRT onto the case were loose. So the last step was just tightening these up a little bit and getting this ready for its big reveal. So just as a reminder, here's what the computer looked like when we started. And here's what it looks like now all cleaned up and ready to be displayed somewhere. It really came out looking great. Like I said, no real physical damage, just a lot of dirt, and it all cleaned up really, really nicely. I'm really excited about how this came out. 
Well, and here it is, all cleaned up and ready to go. I went ahead and loaded actually macOS 7.1.1 because that's kind of the middle of the road and I wanted something a little more advanced than 6.0.8, even though that one is super fast. 7.1.1 will be a little bit more compatible with some of the forward looking things. And I feel like if somebody would have owned this SE30 at the time, they probably would have upgraded macOS at some point. And that seems like a pretty good middle of the road pick to me. So that's all set up and ready to go. And even though this was the dirtiest Mac that I've ever worked on, um, because there was no cosmetic damage, this unit came out really nice. A bit of a Frankenstein because the back uh, uh, case doesn't match the front in terms of what's actually installed. And there's obviously a still a little bit of color difference between the plastics there. I don't think you're really going to notice that though. And of course, I was able to reuse some of my saved parts from other Macs to get this thing working. So really proud of this. I'm going to keep this one and appreciate it and work on it a bit more over time and learn even more about the Macintosh SE30. Now, I'm sure you're probably wondering how much I paid for this at eWaste. Well, the original Macintosh SE30 sold for $6,000, but at eWaste, I was able to pick this up for $10. That's right, $10. And I know my regular viewers probably won't be shocked by that, but I love getting these kind of computers up and running and saving them from the scrap heap. So I'm really glad I was able to do that with this one. I'm actually going to be taking some Q&A on Patreon. Uh, so if you're a, a patron of mine, you'll see that Q&A post come up shortly after this video is published. And I'll leave it up for a few weeks. People can respond to it. If you're not a patron yet and you want to ask questions about the channel, about me, about how I make my videos or anything, really, that would be a great place to ask. Just sign up on my Patreon page and uh, I'll make that open to anyone at any dollar amount. Um, that you pledge and so you'll be able to check that out as well. Thanks by the way to my patrons who make this possible and until next time thanks for watching. Patrons receive ad-free and early access to content after the episode commentary and of course your name in the credits. If you liked that episode, here's a few more you might enjoy, and I thank you for your support. End of line.